Word of God to 1 Samuel chapter 17. First Samuel 17, and we're going to pick up in verse 48. This is a portion of the familiar story of David and Goliath. First Samuel 17, 48. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck the Philistine and killed him. David ran and stood over him. He took hold of the Philistine's sword and drew it from the sheath. After he killed him, he cut off his head with the sword. When the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, they turned and ran. Then the men of Israel and Judah surged forward with a shout. Surged forward with a shout and pursued the Philistines to the entrance of Gath and to the gates of Ekron. Their dead were strewn along the Shearaim road to Gath and Ekron. I want to preach this morning with the Lord's help on a line in the sand. A line in the sand. Pray with me. God, we thank you. We thank you that we can stand in your presence. Lord, I pray for your anointing and your touch today. I want to be pleasing to you. God, I pray that you would do a work in people's hearts. I'm looking to you and depending on you today. God, it's your touch that makes the difference, and we ask for that. In Jesus' name, amen. A line in the sand. We're not entirely sure of the derivation of this saying when we talk about drawing a line in the sand. But for us in the United States of America, probably the most common place, familiar place to us that it goes back to is at the Alamo. Can you give me my picture of the Alamo? At the Alamo... When they were making their last stand there fighting for the independence of Texas, which would become a nation and eventually a state. And they were surrounded, outnumbered many, many times over by General Santa Ana. And just, if I remember correctly, just a hundred or so men take a stand there. They were trying to delay Santa Ana so that General Sam Houston would have time to amass his army and be able to fight more successfully another day. And we know some of the names from there that Davy Crockett died there and Jim Bowie died there. In fact, a personal detail related to this that I love to tell I have a picture of myself with David Crockett at the Alamo. You may not believe that, but it's true. I was there one day, and we were touring. We were there for a church convention, and we were touring 
through the Alamo when I saw a friend of mine walk down the street. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not just preaching, okay? This is the truth. A friend of mine walked down the street, so help me God, his name is David Crockett. <clears throat> we were about to take a picture, and I said, Hey, David, come here. And I waved him over, and I had my picture made at the Alamo with David Crockett. Just wanted you to know that. But famously, when Santa Anna had made the, had made the decree, you know, that either you're going to surrender or we're going to kill you all. Famously, the commander in the fort there, or, or actually the mission there at Alamo, Colonel Travis famously took his sword and drew a line in the sand. And he gave them an option and he said, whoever wants to stand with me, I want you to cross, cross the line. To come, to come with me. And, and in doing that, they knew what that meant. That they were committing all. Every one of the men crossed the line in the sand except for one guy who left. His name was Moses Rose. He was the only man who did not step across the line. I would hate to be remembered in history. As the only one who didn't cross the line. He lived for several years. He didn't care to talk about it. And it wasn't the way that history treats him. It wasn't just that he was a coward. He had fought in many very dangerous battles before. And, and he, in his later years, he was always open to talk about it. So the thing for him, at least the way history re remembers him and, or says about him, and people may have some different opinions about it, but his, his statement was he'd been through battles before and that it wasn't that he was a coward. It was that he didn't think it was worth it. And so he was the only one who lived to tell about it and refused to cross the line. And part of the reason I tell that today is because there's a spiritual line drawn in the sand in our day and time. And we've got to make a decision as to whether we think it's worth it. It may be a courage issue. There may be some courage in or in, but at some point you've got to make a decision if you think it's worth it. And the Bible tells a story, one of the most familiar stories, about this young man named David. And as he was contemplating, Goliath had come out and presented himself. And he was defying God and defying the armies of the living God. And make no mistake about it, in no less terms, and just as real as that, in our day and time, there is a line drawn in the sand. Are you going to cross over? Goliath had come out and he had drawn this battle line. And at one point, David asked the question, is there not a cause? He determined that there was a cause that was worth it. And I just want to remind you today, upon the authority of God's word, that there's a cause that's worth it. That at Calvary, 2,000 years ago, Jesus drew a line in the sand. And we find ourselves at, at a moment where faith, Christian faith, not just on the other side of the world, that's been going on a while, but in the United States of America is being challenged in ways that we could have never imagined and we never thought we'd see in our lifetime. And somewhere, there's got to be a generation that stands up and says, there is a cause and I believe it's worth it and I'm willing to cross the line not only for my faith in Jesus Christ, but 
because there are too many dying and going to hell. And I believe that before Jesus comes back, He wants to touch this old world in revival again. He wants to pour out His Spirit in ways greater than not than any of us have ever seen before. That when you read the book of Acts and that when you come to the line, it's not a stopping point, it's only a starting point. And that what you see in the book of Acts, God intended for that to be a starting point. That He wants us to see more of His glory even than they saw in the book of Acts. He wants to take this church home in a blaze of glory. In the greatest manifestation of His presence the world has ever seen before. I really believe that. But it's going to take people who are willing to cross the line. Now, when you look at David, you understand that, you know, David, he's a young man, and he had gone through a time. You remember the part of the story, before you ever get to this, that Samuel comes to anoint a king because he's looking for somebody different. Saul had been the people's choice, but David was God's choice. And David, Saul looked good on the outside, but David had the heart that was necessary. And when they line up the sons, they leave David out in the fields taking care of the sheep. And it's almost, and it's not until they've gone through every other son until they even think to call David in from the fields. And it's almost as though David doesn't fit in, you know? That he's, he, 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 he's not quite part of the group. And the reason that David, part of the reason that up to this point that David doesn't feel like he fits in is because what God had for him had not come yet. And it was really, now God has his own unique way are y'all hearing me this morning? God has His own unique plan for each of our lives to equip us for what He has for us. And David would go through some years in the cave, in the caves and on the run before he was finally anointed king. But when you look at his life, it was this moment when he faced Goliath that he really steps across the line. That he really steps into his destiny. And the reason that he didn't feel like he fit in before that was because what God had for him hadn't come yet. But it's at this moment that he crosses the line. And can I tell you, I really believe that this is a moment for the church. And there, have, there are some of us, even individually, I told you last week, there are many people, we've, we've been praying for revival for 30 years. Spent our lives and laid down our lives in ministry for some of this stuff. And we've had moments when you felt like you didn't fit in. And the reason, and we've not understood why God has done saying some things the way He has in the church and in the world and we've prayed for a long time and a lot of things have made, haven't made sense. And the reason sometimes we felt like we didn't fit in was because what God had for us hadn't come yet. But I submit to you that it is now, at this moment, is anybody hearing me? In the craziness of this world, when we no longer have home field advantage and the tide has turned against us, and there's the rise that we had hoped it would be in better times. But there is the rise of an antichrist spirit. And there's a hostility against people of Christian faith. The likes of which none of us have ever seen before. It's in this moment that we are just now. That for years God has prepared us for this time. But it's just now we are stepping into our moment and crossing the line. This is what God made us for. I don't know if everybody is getting the full import of what I mean by that and what I'm saying by that. But understand, I really do believe that. 
that God has been preparing us for a long time. We've not always understood everything that was going on, but God intends for this to be our finest hour. God intends for this to be the moment that we cross the line and step in. The world that he had for us hadn't arrived. That's why we didn't feel like we fit into it. But this is the time. to cross the line. But see, there's a, there's a danger with that. I need some help. Jackson, come here a second. Billy Cottrell, come here. Y'all don't have to say anything. Just come stand up here and look good or try anyway. I'm kidding. Come here, Jackson, stand right there. Billy, go stand over there. You, you can face me, you're fine. I want you to hold that. <coughs> I want you to hold that, Billy. If you guys would get down, put it down on the floor. I'm not doing hurdles today. But there's a line. And for David, a line had been drawn. And here's here's the danger. Whenever that moment comes of stepping in to what God has for you, you can be sure that the giant of fear will always show up. I said, whenever it comes time for you to cross the line, you can be sure that the giant of fear will always show up. To intimidate you, to scare you, because he's a bully. Amen. He's a bully. And the temptation is... I, need, I, I, I think I need some more help and I'm looking for Goliath and I'm not sure. Come here, Cliff. You'll work. Compared to me, anyway. Just, just stand right there facing me. Now the Bible says, now I got news for you. Just to accentuate a point. Okay, Goliath's a big guy, Cliff's a big guy, but compared to Goliath, Cliff is a shrimp. Okay, and here's the temptation. The Bible said Goliath is moving toward David. Folks, the devil is in the intimidation business. He'll bring circumstances, he'll bring people. He'll bring your past. He'll bring all kind of stuff. And he's advancing. And the temptation for David when he comes to this moment, because fear will always show up, the temptation is to shrink back. That's always the temptation, to shrink back. Hebrews 10, God said, My soul has no pleasure in those who shrink back. Paul told Timothy, God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. And so when the temptation is to shrink back, the Bible says not only does David cross the line, the Bible says he goes running over the line. He goes running over the line. And my point is this morning... Parkway, I'm talking about an attitude. I'm talking about a spirit that we have shrunk back and played games long enough. We have come to this hour and we've got to have a people. This is our time who rise up and run over the line. Run over the line. 
Because it says something. That's the kind of spirit that God is looking for. And it says something about our spirit and our attitude. Somewhere we've almost gotten to the place that we thought there was holy. Something holy about being timid. About not being too assertive. I'm going to tell you something. The only kind of anointing that's going to shake this world in the hour in which we live is this kind of up in your face anointing that says I ain't backing down to anybody and I refuse to back down when God is backing me up because Goliath may look big but he's not bigger than God. And somewhere there's got to be a spirit on people that charges into the jails and charges into the recovery centers and charges into our schools and charges into society and runs across the line wherever we are and says, I'm here to do battle. God put me here. Hear me this morning. Parkway, we've been here over a hundred years. This is our finest hour. God is, God's been working toward this moment. It's not just time to stand up. It's not just time to step over. It's time to run over the line. Thank you, guys. You're good. Just leave it on the floor. We'll be great now that you've got it down there for me. Give them a good hand. Thank you. Now, I don't say, I don't say what I'm saying lightly, okay? I'm telling you, There are things that God's been getting ready, getting us ready for a long time. And this is our moment, not only to cross the line, but to run over the line. A different kind of spirit. Proverbs told us that it would be possible for us to be bold as a lion. That he wanted us to express that. And please hear what I'm saying. I'm, I'm really not trying to fuss. But it's just the truth. If you backslide over every hangnail. You think you're, you're ready to give up over every little thing that comes your way, then you've got a problem for the last days. You've got a problem for the last days. God, help us. So much of the time, we've acted like we were doing good just to make it to church on Sunday. Everybody smile. We, we, we've been cowardly. I'm sorry, but it bothers me. You say, Pastor, people have different gifts. I understand some of that. And I try to use wisdom with that. But I, I, I've seen people at times who have been in church all their lives, profess to be a Christian for 30 years and act like they couldn't pray over the offering. You missed a good place to say amen right there. Act like they couldn't open, unlock, and lock the church back if we needed them to. If we had ministry and things and needed some 
some help out with some. I, 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 I know that sounds like I'm fussing, but I'm telling you, the times for games are over. There's a giant who is calling our name. There's got to be a people who gets up and runs over the line and says, I'm here. God prepared me for this. I refuse to back down. I know the greater one lives in me. And I've come to get the victory. (laughs) There are multiple examples in Scripture of what I'm talking about. In Matthew 14, when Peter is in the boat and Jesus comes walking on the water and Peter says, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you. And Jesus spoke one word and said, come. When I was an evangelist. I used to preach a message on come. Come. Jesus said, come. And as Peter, I know he would have a struggle or two. That's okay. God can handle your struggles, but at least get out of the boat. And as Peter hikes a leg up over the side of the boat, To climb out. We find fault with Peter. But according to my Bible. Except for Jesus. Peter's the only man ever walked on water. And when he hikes a leg. And is climbing out of the boat. Because Jesus said come. You know what he's doing? He's doing the same thing David did. He's running. To the battle. He's running. Across the line. See what we do. We want to reach our foot out. Are y'all with me? And dip our toe in. And check the temperature first. Now I'm not much of a swimmer. My wife taught me a little bit after we got married. If you pitched me out. And water over my head, I might, maybe, possibly, hopefully, maybe, somehow, by the help of the Holy Ghost, might be able to keep from drowning, maybe. I'm not much of a swimmer. But I remember being a kid and being around the pool. And you know, when you if the water's cold, there are two approaches. You can ease in which I have discovered is much longer and more painful. You may as well jump in, dunk your head, get all in, and do it all at once. Because it, then it's over, you know. But there are people that will dip their toe in. But then I saw a few others when I was a kid that had more guts than I did. And they didn't just, now I stay around, I do get in, I do dunk my head under, my feet are still touching the bottom. But I, I, I've seen some, you know, do the dip your toe in thing, but I've seen others do what they call a cannonball. You know what a cannonball is? Some big dummy. Run to the... Run to the edge and jump and curl up in a ball and plop right in the middle and create all the splash that they can and get everybody wet that they can. (coughs) My point is, and I'm preaching to me just like I am to you, but some of us would get some victory if we quit being toe dippers and start being cannonballers. They go all in. Don't care how big a splash there is. Uh, God put me here and I'm here for a reason. Somebody praise the Lord. You see it with 
the same thing. Peter getting out of the boat. You see it in the heart of Jesus' call to us in Mark 16, 15 when he says, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He gives the go command. In other words, if we're not willing, somebody said go is two-thirds of God's name. And there's, you can't argue with that. We cannot fulfill. That's the only mission he gave us. He does not have a plan B. We cannot do what he told us to do if we're shrinking back. You've got to run across the line. You've got to run across the line. One of the things right now on Wednesday night discipleship in the, here in the adult class, we're in a study on prayer. and When God's people pray, and there's a video component to that that we watch some through it. And, and there are some testimony, profound testimonies of how people in deep sin came to radical faith in Jesus Christ. And one of the things that we've noticed in those video testimonies is that these people by and large, and I'm not saying we should never do this stuff, but we've thought if we could have the right program, come on, if we could put on the right show, if we could have enough bells and whistles, if we could have a big enough dog and pony show, come on. I heard about one guy years ago After Trigger died, he got a Roy Rogers horse. He got him stuffed and toured around the country with him and preached the gospel. Brother, if you got somebody saved and got a crowd, more power to you. But we've tried Trigger. We've tried tried everything coming and going. And these people that we've been watching their testimonies, Jennifer and I observed each other. It wasn't some program. It wasn't some outreach. It wasn't some giveaway. It was because somebody, some Christian, some believer came into contact with them and got a burden for them and prayed until they prayed them out of the hell holes they were living in and saw them radically transformed by the grace of Jesus. Christ and that's the only thing that's going to happen and work in southeast Kentucky it's not our building it's not another program we've got not just in this pulpit but you have to get radical enough that you run across the line and drag somebody back to safety (laughs) there's got to be a a go you remember, you remember in Acts 19 when there were these guys called the seven sons of Siva. And they'd watched Paul do it and they decided they were going to cast out devils. So they went around trying to cast out devils and said, in the name of the God whom Paul preaches... We command you to come out. And the devil spoke back to him and said, I know Jesus. I know Paul. Who are you? And then the devil came after them and beat the tar out of them until they were beaten and bloody. You know why? Because they didn't know who they were and whose they were. And what they'd been called to do. Folks, the simple fact is, David feared God, not man. You can look at how big it seems. But he is running across the line. And there have to be those of us who know who we are and whose we are and what we've been called to do. And be persuaded of it. I have shared with you before. I won't take the time to go into all of it right now. But if we impact a region, a state, one life at a time for Jesus Christ. Listen, please see my heart. This is, I'm not playing games I'm not trying to be seen. This is not just 
what I do or what I talk about when I'm on the platform on Sunday morning. We've got others working with us, but you know what I'll be doing tonight? I'll be in a recovery center eating pizza and pouring into a handful of guys trying to do some basic discipleship and see their lives turned around for the I'm serious about this. This is not just when I'm up here. And I've told you before, God calls pastoral ministry as equippers and enablers, but it doesn't all happen in the pulpit. We come in here on Sunday wanting to get you in the presence of the Lord And I get up and preach, not because all the ministry happens on the platform. We're just trying to give you marching orders to go back out in the real world tomorrow and have enough of the Holy Ghost about you that there's an overflow that when you charge against Goliath, that something happens and things change. Let me give you this and I'm done. In the 1800s, there was a concept that was very well known and widely embraced, a mindset in America, widely held, and it was called Manifest Destiny. Manifest destiny. Now, our nation really is still relatively young on the international scene. I've stood in Poland and some places in Europe and beheld the beauty of those cities that existed when we were still in log cabins. They'd tour me through Krakow in Poland, which is one of my favorite places I've ever been. They'd tour me through Krakow and say, this new part of city, 1800s, they've been around a long time. We only came into existence in the late 1700s, and so by the 1800s, we had not yet reached from sea to shining sea. But there was a widely held belief in American society and manifest destiny. And basically what it meant was, and it's what empowered pioneers to go through everything they went through and clear the land and travel in covered wagons and babies die and all kind of stuff. It was because they believed in manifest destiny. In other words, they believed that it was God's will for the United States of America to extend from one ocean to the other, from sea to shining sea. It was a widely held belief. They believed that it was God's will because European powers would have carved up the nation and they believed it was God's will for it to go from the, from, for the United States to cover from the east to the west. Now, Historians today sometimes view that negatively, that belief in manifest destiny, because sometimes the way we went about it was not always positive. Many times we took it as a license to be very cruel in our treatment of Native Americans and some things like that. So sometimes the way we went about it was not always good. However, in its core, that belief itself, which I I do believe was God's will, it became the core conviction that empowered pioneers to do everything, anything and everything they had to do to settle this land from one coast to the other. And that's what drove them, and that's what got them through everything they went through. 
And I said that to say this. They believed in manifest destiny. They believed that they knew what God's will was and it empowered them to put them across the line. And we need a belief in a spiritual manifest destiny that everywhere the sole of our feet shall tread, it shall belong to us. That there are some things that God has ordained for me to have. And I'm going to hold on and I'm going to charge whatever line I got to charge to be who God wants me to be and to do what God wants me to do. Because I guarantee for every person sitting in this room, there are people that it's God's will for you to reach. There are ministries that it's God's will for you to perform. There's a promised land that God has for you. And you can't play games about it. David knew if he's going to take what was God's will, he couldn't just ease over. He had to run over. And this is our time. This is our moment. I believe in this time that it's the most crucial that any of us have ever faced. That it's time for the church to run across the line into the face of the enemy and take what God said we could have. Stand with me.